So uh, thank you, Jean Thomas. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'm Kuba Mościcki. I work in the uh, IT storage uh, group at CERN, and uh, I'm leading uh, one of the sections in this group. And I'll be giving this presentation jointly with Dan, uh, uh, who works uh, together with me, and he is leading the, our CEF activity. And we will uh, we will essentially try to give you a few examples of uh, how we are currently looking into providing a more unified storage environment and how uh, this uh, relates to the HPC activities that we have at CERN, but also to the high energy physics um, data processing uh, uh, more general. So first, let's locate ourselves in a time space. So we are essentially sitting on the edge of this big accelerator that probably many of you know. So this is one of the biggest scientific instruments in the world, if not the biggest. And essentially, it is uh, colliding uh, particles that are accelerated in this 30 kilometer tunnel uh, at a rate of around 11,000 times a second. So the beam goes in, uh, uh, beam goes around at the speed of light in this tunnel. And then there are these four interaction points and it collides at a very high rate. So there are head-on head collisions. There are two beams, a matter and an antimatter, and they are colliding in this collision points. And essentially, we have 25 megahertz collision rate at these four experiments, and that generates a lot of data. Uh, uh, and uh, essentially, this data is stored, and is stored. This is the main role of our group, IT storage. We are storing around 50 to 80 petabytes per year uh, in the previous run uh, of the of the accelerator, and we, so far we have accumulated nearly. We are approaching one exabyte of um, combined disk and uh, tape storage. And we are storing this in the computing center, which is located uh, which is located close to this ring. And in the background, you can see Lake Geneva, actually the airport. So it gives you also the, 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 the notion of size. There's a three kilometers air, uh, airport runway in the background. So we are focused on storing, uh, uh, on storing all the LHC data, but actually we also have, I wanted to highlight that we have some, some roles that is beyond that. So actually we are also developing and operating this major LHC disk uh, uh, tape system, EOS and SEN tape archive. We're also providing essentially uh, entire storage infrastructure for home directories and the sync and share platform for our users of the, uh, the all users in the laboratory and the entire storage infrastructure for the lab for various different activities. We are also um, we also have. Uh, a leading role, and we are representative for the CEF uh, in the CEF community, in the wider research community. <clears throat> We've been one of the first adopters of CEF technology uh, in research, and uh, at some point in time, I think we've had the biggest uh, CEF uh, cluster in the known universe, and we've been actually um, uh, contributing a lot to the development of this technology. Uh, based on the practical experience and uh, and understanding of this technology. So we have quite a lot of uh, experience there. And uh, among many other leading roles that we have, uh, we also are now part of a, a wider effort for European Open Science Cloud, where we do work on collaborative storage federations and also uh, on a wider role for sync and share services for research applications. So from that position, uh, here is a simplified view of uh, some of our storage services. You can see we have essentially two families of services, one which are based on the EOS file storage and the other ones which are based on self object storage. And these are all uh, run and operated in, in essentially by our team. Uh, on the EOS based services, we have this, uni uh, let's say, very well integ uh, vertically integrated solution, which provides a sandbox interface 
on top of on top of EOS. This is essentially our Dropbox on premises. So it provides a sync and share capability and access to user data on all platforms uh, and uh, including mobile devices. Uh, so this is our Dropbox for Science uh, uh, service that we provide. And it's also integrated with uh, various web applications for scientific data visualization. And uh, last but not least, it also is used as uh, one of the main uh, um, one of the main storage targets for high throughput computing in our farm uh, and also our central Linux infrastructure. Then accessible from a web-based analysis platform that I will uh, talk about a bit later. Um, and of course, this is the place where physicists do the analysis. Uh, and we have around 18 petabyte of general storage and around 400 petabyte of physics storage integrated in this in the system. Then, on the other hand, we also have a Ceph-based storage, which serves, which exposes many different interfaces, including AFS filers, CDMFS for software distribution. Uh, but importantly, it's also uh, a key component for our infrastructure based on OpenStack, Kubernetes, and OpenShift. And with CephFS, it plays an increasingly important role for different applications, including HPC. Uh, and we are looking into, uh, and what we will be describing are the ways we're trying to look into achieving some synergies between these two these two families of, of, of services. So clearly we see, uh, you know, we have been investigating this kind of in integrated service environments for, 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 for some time, and this is also how Sandbox was born, um, with uh, the view that uh, service integration, if done at the correct level, really provides an added value for the user. You know, you can you have plenty of obvious examples from public clouds. The way, for example, Google or Amazon provide an added value for the users. Their services are very tightly integrated, and then at the end of the day, users are really provided with a very streamlined and complete user experience. Uh, then uh, we also look into this uh, service integration by trying to leverage on the combined storage technology to provide the most optimized service. As I said, in our group, we do have a lot of storage expertise uh, with open source for high throughput computing, but also in the Ceph, uh, in the Ceph, realm, Ceph realm, and also being able to optimize uh, the cost benefit of available hardware resources at our data center. We are purchasing a lot of commodity hardware and we are looking into into the ways of how to combine these different technologies in order to to maximize that 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 uh, that investment. So we will give you some practical examples of our prototypes and experiments, focusing on three, let's say on three three examples how to make it easier for users to access data which is traditionally confined in the HPC storage system. How integrating HPC storage with a, a larger, wider web-based analysis environment, and also our um, our investigation of uh, some synergies on the core technology storage technology between physics-oriented storage and HPC-oriented storage. Very briefly, we are part of a much bigger system, which is called Worldwide LHC Computing Grid. So our data center is essentially one of the 200 data centers. And here the takeaways are that uh, throughout, throughout all this uh, chain, uh, there's a big dis data distribution uh, system that connects these data centers and also for processing of data. In all these different steps, we are essentially talking about high throughput computing. So this is, so high energy physics is really about high throughput computing. And uh, uh, this community also invested a lot into implementing open storage software Develop de develop open storage software to optimize our access patterns for for high energy physics use cases. Uh, now, taking a bigger picture, HPC resources will start playing and already start playing increasingly more important role in this larger ecosystem because 
we see that more and more um, uh, capacity is provided by the age centers. So that's another point connecting us to the larger HPC picture. Then here's, of course, our challenge. So we are more or less at the end of uh, long shutdown two in 2021. And as you can see with the up progressive upgrades of the detector of the LHC accelerator and detectors, we will essentially be facing increasingly higher rates of, of, of data in the next years uh, while our budget is flat. So now let me uh, turn the attention into one of the integrated web uh, data analysis environments that has been in production already for several years at CERN. It's an extremely successful service that provides a uh, Jupyter uh, notebook uh, web front end, but it's a fully integrated service environment. So users just log in to the, uh, uh, through their web browser and they have the entire environment ready for them and set up. So they have access to all the analysis platforms um, uh, with, the, with all the software uh, that is, uh, sometimes very complicated uh, software stacks uh, prepared by the experiments, access to all the computing powers for various clusters, HD Condor, Spark, uh, etc., and very tightly integrated with, with SEND storage. So on one, it's integrated with Sandbox to make it easy for, uh, for users to access their user data. And uh, on the other hand, it's based on EOS, so users of this system can access the entire LHC data set, so the, the, the entire 400 petabytes. And that turned out to be very successful. We have plenty of different use cases from data analysis, machine learning, acceleration logging, uh, and several hundreds of people using this system daily. And this is one example from one of the experiments. It's actually a slide I borrowed from a user that reported uh, it, and this shows one of the interesting aspects is how we are fusing the online and offline access to the user data. So essentially people can get their outputs or inputs on their laptop and then very easily synchronize this uh, and make it available in the online platform and then reach out to the full data set. So this works very nicely. Now, uh, we also do have at CERN some high performance computing, genuine high performance computing applications and use cases. They typically do not fit uh, standard HTC model, typically MPI applications. So there is a lattice QCD studies, beam simulations, uh, CFD, and, and this kind of things. And for this, we have, op we have a dedicated uh, HPC cluster, which is based on commodity hardware with InfiniBand, for which we do provide CFFS. And this is, this is the basic, this is the basic uh, let's say, picture here. And we, the idea is to provide the uh, scratch spaces via CFFS. But in practice, we see that this is CFFS became a very convenient store of outputs, inputs, and, and essentially home, home data, home directory data. So this is one of our prototypes now. We are implementing, we are prototyping uh, access to this uh, CFFS scratch space used by HPC cluster via Sandbox. So it will be much easier for users to uh, to get uh, some of the user data in and out through already existing set of, 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 of sandbox interfaces. So in, in a way we are defining uh, the, the, the CFFS cluster. And actually we are not the only one having this idea here. I, I found uh, one of the reports from an HPC center where they have, where they have also been experimenting with using sync and share system in order to make uh, their HPC uh, scratch spaces, uh, this time with a real supercomputer and the real parallel file system more accessible to the user systems. So using this kind of, uh, this kind of sync and share system as a bridge. Now uh, going, um, so that is one example. The second example is that once we have that sandbox integration, there's also a user demand uh, for accessing this CFFS scratch space for HPC from our existing SWAN environment, so this web-based data analysis environment. Uh, and we do it uh, by essentially exposing CFFS mounts integrated with the same Kerberos-based authentication. And in this way, uh, HPC users can also leverage and benefit from all the power of this web-based analysis platform. And at the same time, they also access long-term storage and our entire LHC set uh, that is stored on EOS. 
So as you can see, this really goes into the direction of providing a much more integrated user environment and service environment for the for the for the end users. So I now I will give uh, uh, the stage to Dan about so who will tell us about more work that we do on the actual backend technology synergy between physics uh, and HPC storage, uh, so with EOS and CFFS. So Dan, please, the floor is yours. Thanks, Kubo. So this third example is, uh, is really looking at how we do storage in this high luminosity IFC scenario. Oops. The... Kuba, I think you went back to the original slide. No. Oh, this was my mistake, so Kuba, please. Um, share your screen again. I thought okay. you could take over. I, I didn't realize you didn't you you shared your screen. Sorry. Okay. So okay, let's do this again. Okay, can you see the screen? It's loading. Here we yes. go. So in this HLLHC. Uh, near future, we'll be looking at numbers something like up to 500 petabytes per year by towards the end of this decade. Um, and there's obviously a lot of work going on in this area to, to, to make it so we can handle this scale of data. Uh, one of the one of the things is that our our physics data format team called uh, root, they're working on a new data format called RN couple. Um, this new format is targeted at like extremely high IOPS NVMe devices. So the goal there is to be able to uh, read data, keep CPUs busy at like gigabytes per second, processing data at gigabytes per second. Um, so I'll have something on that. Now, at this scale and performance numbers, uh, we wanted to like take a step back and see what type of like what the open source storage systems have because we know that things like uh, Seth or other things out there in the market uh, have compelling features and maturity. So we want to see what role that they would play in our future physics storage systems. However, like even on paper, we have a very special environment that's really targeted for our use cases. So like our authorization schemes, like with Psi tokens. Uh, quotas and ACL layouts are quite custom, and also the access protocols that we use. Like most of our access in our in our worldwide environment is via the XRD D protocol, and also like these off-the-shelf open source software misses uh, where we don't know how it's going to perform on a, on commodity hardware. So can you go to the next slide, Kuba? Here's a. Here's a slide. The text there is not that the quality of the stream seems not that good. Maybe it's my internet. But um, here's some benchmarks showing the speed up of this new data format, RNTuple. So the trick with RNTuple is that it's all implemented using libIOU ring. So this is the new, uh, the new um, uh, IO interface in the Linux kernel avoiding context switches. So this is the speed up. This plot is showing like speed up achieved with this new format. Um, by adding like parallel reads, parallelism. So we're getting like 3x speed ups on, uh, on cold cache scenarios for our different uh, different benchmarks from our users up to like 6x speed up for, for um, cache scenarios. Can you go next slide. Um, now about Seth, like the, the point of view that we're coming to from this work is that Lots of, uh, it's very popular now, it's very common now for research environments, universities or labs to just have this stack anyway, have this open infrastructure stack. So uh, they'll have on-site Kubernetes or OpenShift to manage like the typical IT applications and also like job work analysis workflows. Maybe it's backed by OpenStack um, and maybe then they have like a Ceph anyway doing block or, or object storage. So this is kind of common anyway. So, and and we at CERN have had this stack for for since 2013, basically, um, the bottom part at least. Um, and then since 2017, we've also been using uh, CephFS with HPC and IT use cases. So then we we're like asking ourselves, is it efficient if we just like merge 
our locally developed EOS storage system for the big physics data and layer that on top of 7FS. What, what can we get there? What can we, if we layer on top of that infrastructure? Just some detail about what is EOS. Um, this is this large scale storage that's developed at CERN for physics and regular users. 350 petabytes of actual data now. Um, some of the nice features it has is like HSM functionalities via our CERN tape archive software. Um, and then also the sync and share and workbook functionalities in that Kuba mentioned uh, how it's integrated with CERNbox. Um, it's actually straightforward to use, to prototype a kind of merge system by using, like configuring an EOS cluster using CFS as the backend. So rather EOS is normally storing uh, its backend data onto like local XFS uh, file systems on the on local disk servers. Um, but in this case, we just like create CFS cluster, mount it with the kernel mount, which is highly efficient and has nice read ahead properties and gives you really high performance. And then you kind of delegate. So you, you, you trick EOS into thinking that these are local file systems and you just delegate this the, the the redundancy and, and high availability to the CFS layer and then store everything in EOS with one single replica. Of course, you might ask, well, what happens if these like single EOS gateways go down? But EOS has a feature to very quickly like move to relocate file systems, like backend file systems between servers. So you can you can get quite high availability anyway with this kind of layered uh, architecture. So we built a proof of concept using some some of our newest uh, extremely low cost commodity disk servers. So these servers are dual Xeon, 192 gigs of RAM. They have 100 gigabit ethernet and each server has 60 uh, 14 terabyte SATA drives. Uh, this is, we, we did a backend with, uh, with a somewhat recent version of Ceph, like, 15.28, this was recent uh, as of when we did this test earlier this year. So next slide, please. So this is a picture of how the IO works in this, uh, in this layered setup. So if we're writing data objects, like say the data object is 16 megabytes, um, in our detailed like tests we did, we varied object sizes and kind of parameters swept the whole, the whole performance space of this, of this layered application and presented results. Um, but I'm just giving like con a condensed uh, results of this of this work but just to explain a little bit how it works like um in so we were doing erasure coding and we were testing different object sizes different erasure coding layouts so four plus two or eight plus two or 16 plus two read solomon coding in all the scenarios you have eos writing in these files to the to the cephs file system and then those are written to like one node in eos this is in ceph sorry and so a 60 meg object goes to the primary who does the work to split this into the erasure coding chunks. Um, next slide, please. Here is a backend uh, performance uh, uh, measurement. So this was using four plus two erasure coding on this test cluster. Simply doing, um, simply doing like high throughput testing of the CFS backend from these, from these like, uh, these, the places where, like the kernel mounts where we were, we were mounting CFS, this is just to get the performance of the CFS cluster basically. So with each client, when we had up to four client nodes running, we they were getting roughly four and a half gigabytes per second streaming read. Um, so it was linear and then the, eventually the cluster saturated at, uh, at uh, 22 gigabytes per second um, with all eight client nodes actually reading simultaneously. On the, on the other hand, uh, when we were doing write throughput tests, uh, we were actually getting more gigabytes per second. So roughly six gigabytes per second, increasing up to and saturating at around 33 gigabytes per second or 34 gigabytes per second. Um, this, this actually, dis this discrepancy between streaming read and stri streaming write seems counterintuitive at first, but in fact, it's probably just an artifact of the way that we ran the test because when you're when you're doing just streaming writes and there's no other IOs on the on the backend cluster, things are basically laid out linearly. So you're just actually the disk heads are just writing streaming to the disk, and all the disks are performing at their peak, uh, something like 200 megabytes per second each. Um, the in the read scenario, however, it's 
almost impossible to schedule the reads so that they're in order on the disks. Even if you read them back at the same order you wrote them, they're probably, because there's like so many concurrent writers happening originally, it's impossible to read back in, in, in order. So you can't get, you end up with lots of streaming uh, or lots of, um, lots of seeks on the disk heads and then, and then the read performance can't match the write performance. So next slide, please. And then this is a test now. We ask ourselves, what is the performance impact of putting our EOS on top of ZFS? Okay. So I'll try to walk you through this slide. So starting from the left-hand side, this is, I'm not presenting the performance numbers as the aggregate anymore. I'm presenting the performance numbers per transfer. So we had several, like something like 1,000 transfers concurrent, okay? And this is this is writing, this is now a write test. So the scenario is that we have, suppose we're doing data taking and we're trying to take data at uh, 50 gigabytes per second or so, that's our goal. Okay, we saw this, this small cluster could only do 30 gigabytes per second, but anyway. We start with one particular, um, uh, on the left, we start with the Ceph only, and it's taking roughly six seconds per transfer. This is a two gigabyte file, and it takes roughly six seconds per transfer, okay, if we were just to write that into CephFS natively. Then we move to the, to the right, to the second bar, okay? The gray is showing that actually the time per transfer is the same. It's still, it was still six seconds per transfer of a two gigabyte file. However, we ended up with huge long tails of, of the transfers. The green line is showing the 99th percentile transfer. So it was 25 seconds for the 99th percentile transfer and up to around 50 seconds for the, the, the end, 100th 100, 100 percentile, let's say. Um, so by layering applications on top of each other, the average performance stayed the same. However, we end up with these very long tails, which are unacceptable actually for our data taking scenario. So what we found that we had to do was to, was to put some throttles on the EOS side. Uh, this is the third, the third plot now. So by putting throttles on the, on the EOS side, we could bring those long tails back. So by throttling to 325 megabytes per second per transfer, this was the sweet spot that we found. The long tails came back to basically native CephFS performance. And the average, again, stayed around six seconds. It was, it was fine. And then just, just, for, just to show that this was the sweet spot, we increased to 350 megabytes per second per transfer client-side throttle. So that's EOS as the client. Um, and again, like the long tails increased. So that's just showing that the that the that that was indeed the the sweet spot in this uh, next slide please so just wrapping up that particular study um, that's just a very like short part of, of the test we did uh, we just we we found and we concluded that CentOS and EOS were easily stackable and gave like excellent performance on this uh, this low cost quantity disk server technology and hundred gig Ethernet. Um, it had a, the EOS friend had had a marginal impact on the overall performance versus native Rados, aside from those long tails that we mentioned. So now what we're looking at is like further integration between these two systems in the, in the R and D context. Um, one thing is that I didn't, I didn't show explicitly, but the namespaces in this, in, in our proof of concept, we had two namespaces. You have an EOS namespace, which is implemented on RocksDB, and then you have the CephFS namespace, which is implemented in Ceph native uh, metadata server. So it actually is possible to use, to, to, to add a feature to EOS to just use the CephFS namespace. And if we're using the same namespace, then we could also implement uh, like on the client side, the real user client side, we could, we could do various tricks to allow our users to directly access the files from CephFS. So rather than going via the EOS file system, a fuse mount, and then throw an EOS FST, the, the, the EOS disk server uh, daemon, and then redirect it again to, to, to Ceph, we could just have direct IO to CephFS. Um, so we're looking at basically a, a fuse mount, a very thin fuse mount, that mounts internally in a private kernel namespace, the CephFS client, and then adds on top the things that we need, like Kerberos, like this uh, HSM functionality with the, with, the, with the CERN tape archive, and also this brings the integration to, to CERNbox. 
um, for, for those other use cases. And I think there's one more slide, right, Kuba? Yeah, so that's actually the end of our talk. Um, yeah, so HPC tenders are, are playing a role. Um, and then we have these, and they're playing the role because of course we have these ever increasing requirements in, in data rates, throughputs and, uh, and reliability and performance. Um, so we've shown a few different examples, three examples. And uh, if that's interesting, of course, we're very happy to, to hear from people that have similar, similar, similar uh, requirements or interests. And I think that's it. Okay, thanks a lot for this uh, very uh, comprehensive presentation. So uh, we have time, I guess, for, for a couple of very short, que uh, of short questions. So one is very technical and the other one is a bit more, I uh, will say, a broader scope. So the first question, let's start with a broader question, is that how did you... Um, uh, how did you choose between investment in uh, existing solution and developing storage solution by yourself? So short answer, please, sorry. Because <laughs> afterwards, there is a second question. You're muted, Kuba. Oops. You're on mute, uh, Kuba. Oh, sorry. So we so you have to essentially take time as a predominant factor. When we started developing this storage solution, there was nothing else really suitable. Excellent. <laughs> and the second, 15 years ago. <laughs> and the second question um, is a bit more um, uh, technical, narrow. So regarding the erasure coding, so if EOS is writing on a single server before doing the uh, eraser coding, are you worried about data loss if there is a failure between the write and the transaction? So there's actually no difference between EOS writing to a local XFS in this scenario, in which case it does F-sync before it, of course, closes the, the client transfer and marks that file as, uh, as written in the EOS namespace. It's exactly the same in CephFS because CephFS is respecting the exact same uh, consistency semantics as a local file. So EOS calls false F-sync when it's, if the, I mean, EOS is not calling F-sync all the time. It's, uh, it's depending on the semantics of our, of our use cases, but for the data taking scenario where files are transferred in um, directly from the, the, the detectors, there's an F-sync on close, and that F-sync is passed down to CephFS, and EOS is not uh, is is doing this as a transaction. So yes, it's synchronous. There's no there's no chance of data loss between between this uh, in the scenario you described, Glenn. Okay, so thanks a lot. Uh, it's still possible to to chat if you want to to ask more questions to the speaker. Um,